Welcome to We're All Gonna Die and Other Fun Facts, a semi-regular, occasionally amusing, and rarely funny series of conversations on a random topic. This episode is entitled The Miracles That Keep Charlie Bryce Going, and it is about Charlie Bryce's new collection of poems, The Miracles That Keep Me Going. And our guest for this episode is who is someone who knows something about the miracles that keep Charlie Bryce going. Actually, it's Charlie Bryce, of all people. <laughs> Hi, Charlie. Welcome to the podcast. Welcome to all of the the fun and horror that is these random top random conversations. Well, you know, I mean, we are all going to die, man. And I'm glad that if I'm going to die, I get to talk about it with you. So I'm very happy. Well, I'm here, glad. Here's the book. Isn't that a beautiful cover? Oh, that is a beautiful cover. Yeah. That cover... Uh, this is a detail from a painting by a very good friend of ours, uh, Joyce Savory. And oh, okay. the cover was designed by my really wonderful friend, uh, Jim Hutt, who happens to be married to Joyce. So, ah. yeah, it's, it's it's a very different cover for me. Yes. And uh, what's the street date on, on this new collection? What's the what? When will it when will it officially be out and, it's and out. available? It's out now. It is out. And if people want to get it from me, which I would like because I get more money that way, <laughs> yes. um, they can just email me at Charlie C H A R L I E dot rice B as in boy R I C E at gmail.com. And um uh, I, I'm taking Venmo, PayPal, checks, cash, gold, uh, <laughs> silver, anything you can buy, I'll take, you know. <laughs> yes, and I will post that uh, email address and stuff on on the website when I post this. So. Well, great. It'll yeah, be, so and, it'll, but, and it'll be embedded even in the MP3. Why not? If people come to my lunch, you know, my book lunch, which I, I'm doing with you, Matt, Matt is that, that you are, he's going to, Matt's going to uh, read uh, at the book lunch with uh, Miss McCross and Jay Carson on September 14th at Riverstone Books in um, Squirrel Hill at seven o'clock. And it's also going to be on Zoom. So, um, if you go to Riverstone Books to the event page and um, respond to the virtual um, button or whatever it is, they'll send you information about how to get on Zoom. But if you come to the launch, I'm selling these books, almost giving them away, almost having to register as a charity now to sell them for $15. But uh, if I have to ship them, Unfortunately, the post office really raised their media mail rates, so I I have to charge nineteen dollars altogether. But still, registering as a charity, I mean, you know, absolutely. What can I say? <laughs> yes, and also I should clarify since the internet is quasi forever, and there is a sometimes glacial pace. I think this is episode one hundred nine of the podcast. I think episode one hundred seven is from October last year. Woo, woo. So, so I should say that it, this is September 14th, the year of our Lord, 2023. Amen. Amen, brother. Amen. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, so if you're listening in 2024, you missed the launch. Yeah, you missed it. But you go to Riverstone still... Books on the 14th. It's a great place. Yeah. It's a cool store. And you can still email me if I'm alive. You know, I'll respond. This is true. <laughs> This is true. Or if email still works or if civilization yeah. is still happening or <laughs> American democracy is still happening. Yeah. Or, yeah. or if we're not all in jail. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I got to work on that uh, right of return EU passport. You know, <laughs> the, the the war in Ukraine is so I could potentially get it through Slovakia. Wow. And, uh, you know, which I have a friend who's a bit more politically paranoid than I am who got it through Hungary. And he said for him, it's if push comes to shove, I I would be able to either get over the Canadian border or on a plane with this passport. Wow. And, and once he said that is one of those things that like split the world in half for me. And I went, oh, yeah, I should do it. But of course, you know, 
trying to immigrate into a country that borders the Ukraine is not, uh, maybe it's a little more complicated these days. They probably have enough extra people. They might not be interested in me. Well, I could try to get a passport from Ireland, but probably no no country would accept me if I did that. <laughs> well, but here's the thing: once you get the EU passport, you can you can Just be go. in the EU. All right, you can be, you know. <laughs> but anyway, and I and I think uh, Danelle might try through Ireland as well herself, just because oh, wow. you just don't. I mean, we're at this moment. Which I'm let's dovetail back into poetry here for a minute because I think one of the things that I I always admire about your poetry and I like you know we're in a poetry workshop group together I think we should confess as well not only are we reading together but I saw the sort of advanced version of some of these poems or the draft version of some of these poems um, is the way that you have this this wonderful poetic voice that balances humor and acknowledgement of really the worst in life yeah, and the so worst funny. possibilities of life and also can be funny at the same time which i think is um is remarkable is i think the, the sort of the x factor of your poetry i think is the x factor. well thank you thank you so much matt that's awfully nice of you to say, you know, it is true that there's a, a lot of people out there don't don't either know uh, that poetry can be humorous, or uh, you know, or some people think it shouldn't be. But that's just for me. That's ridiculous. I agree with Billy Collins, who says that humor is the gateway to some of the more uh, distressing emotions or difficult emotions. Um, but humor itself is an achievement. Yeah, you know, I was a psychoanalyst for 35 years, and I always knew my patients were getting better when they did two, one of two things or both, which is sometimes they would spontaneously start to exercise without me ever saying anything about that. The other thing, though, um, what is that uh, they could begin to um, tell jokes about themselves, take themselves Mm. in a humorous way that's a real achievement that's a real movement into into mental health as far as i'm concerned and uh, and i do try to do uh that sort of thing in fact in fact i happen to have a poem right here that kind of oh good you just said it's not from the book it's a it's a newer poem it's from my next book my next book which i'm shopping around right now is entitled tragedy in the arugula aisle so right there is a little bit of humor just in the title yes. but <laughs> anyway this poem is called hippocratitis mm. do you suffer from the need to have a twice impeached four times indicted adjudicated sex abuser do your thinking for you are family values critical to your identity and yet you blindly follow a man who brags about grabbing women's genitals and who had an affair with a porn star four months after his third wife gave birth to their son. Do you call yourself a Christian then tell an 11-year-old rape victim that she must carry her baby to term? Do you chortle that you are pro-life but advocate for the death penalty and refuse to support child care programs and school lunches for all those unwanted babies once they are grown? Are you more concerned about banning books children read about gays than banning the automatic weapons used to kill those children? Do you think that neo-Nazis chanting Jews will not replace us are, quote, very fine people? Do you rail against socialism then demand that the government keep its hands off your Medicare? You may be suffering from moderate to severe Hippocratitis. Ask your doctor about oxymoron. 30 infusions of oxymoron delivered anally each month should help you regain some consistency and reason rubber turkey based or delivery device sold separately some people using oxymoron have developed 
musicus flatulence perpetuum, a bewildering disorder that causes the anus to hum, I'm a Yankee doodle dandy, during sexual congress. Don't take oxymoron if you are allergic to truth and facts, as doing so may cause every mirror in your home to explode. Call your doctor and stop taking oxymoron immediately if you begin to tell the truth compulsively when discretion would be best, a rare condition called candoria. Your road back to consensual reality and critical thinking is waiting at the tip of your turkey baster. Ask your doctor about oxymoron today. Yeah. That that is our world. That I mean, <laughs> I guess there's, there's there's the question of laughing to keep from crying, and laughter in terms of you know slipping the the the, the deeply uncomfortable truth. Well, that's what I I shoot for is is laughter to get you to think, you know. I mean, that's, that's an old, old tradition, you know, uh, um, laugh-in was something I uh, I grew up with. Uh, those programs on TV were all the Smothers Brothers Hour. All these were very, very funny and yet incredibly satirical and thought-provoking. So that's what I try to reach for in a poem like a yeah. poem that is yeah, which I mean, you know, that poem also reminds me of it's the who knows whether he actually said it or not, but it's, it's it looks really nice as a meme in our post truth era. I'll believe that Werner Herzog said in like 2016 or 7, 2017, you Americans are waking up to the fact, like we Germans once did, that a third of your population would gleefully kill another third of your population, yeah. and the other third would just watch and not care. Um, which is a it is a hard truth. Um, but yeah, I, I yeah, <laughs> sorry, I'm I'm a little stunned actually for a podcast to be be rendered speechless is is <laughs> bad news. Well, Judy and I talk about that that we really feel that we're experiencing what uh, a lot of just regular Germans experienced in the 30s. Uh, as this guy who they everybody thought was a joke um, and, a, and a kind of a fool started to just get very, very, very popular and do awful, awful things. And, you know, there you are. You're sitting there thinking, well, what do I do? You know, very, very difficult. Yeah. And, and you know... When we were when we were meeting at the poetry group on Saturday, only just a couple of days ago, earlier in this holiday weekend, uh, you know, I was saying about how after that, the Frankfurt School, especially like people like Adorno, Theodore Adorno, especially, started really thinking about you know how did we get to this point and w was it embedded in our culture. This, this door that was always ready to be opened, this door that was unlocked even, maybe. You know, Adorno, In that. Adorno is a really interesting guy. Do you know he wrote the best book I've ever read on Nietzsche? And here he was, a yes. kind of a, a positivist uh, philosopher. But anyway, I yeah, we didn't know. I mean, you know, when I was much younger than you and I was in college, uh, here we were i mean we were protesting it was 1968 69 we thought that love was the answer and we thought that we were having a revolution and what we didn't realize was that evangelical church attendance was rising exponentially at the same time because yeah. we didn't have yeah. we didn't have any congress with those people so yes i think he's right that this stuff has been embedded in our culture and if you, you know, I've been reading some awful books recently, um, Homegrown by Jeffrey Tubin. He goes, mm. he shows that, you know, this kind of fear mongering and prejudice has been with us since pretty much the beginning of the, of the country. Um, yeah. it, it's, it's really quite something. It's, it's, it, it is embedded in the culture. He's right, I think. 
Yeah, which, yeah, and and so the other thing is, so you have these poems that do that are in, are politically engaged. Um, I think you also, I think, which I think is a much harder move that you make in some of your poems, is that you your your use of humor when talking about the personal and the sort of the 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 small tragedies of of a, and of an everyday life and you're able to do that too which i think is that you know it's like there's a whole industry of political satire now as as things go further and further off the rails you know the fact that john stewart has come back kind of from the dead or you know That's and there's cool, Stephen colbert yeah. has got another show. yeah you know all of those things um, but also, and, and in a way it's maybe that's somewhat, it still can be somewhat external and you can say, well, at least I can still lock my door in my house and hope for the best that maybe, maybe I will get that EU passport or whatever, or, <laughs> you know, we're only five hours to Canada. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, last time I was in Niagara Falls, I could see the peace bridge. Wow from my from my thing and just thinking about like and i drove past it and i went wow you know what point you know yeah at what point will people start skiing for refugees every time i think of canada i think about that when's the first time people are going to start looking for native born americans there was a bunch of and this wasn't really a story that played well here but played on the cbc a lot that a number of people who came to the u.s as refugees did some pretty gnarly things to get across the Canadian border mm. before Trump got inaugurated. Wow. Like people who lost hands to frostbite kind of stuff. Oh, yeah. To, to get through Quebec, into Quebec in January, through the woods kind of stuff. Well, um, in, in, in my day, in the anti-diluvian period, when I was in college, some people were doing things like shooting themselves literally in the foot uh with a gun uh, are cutting off their fingers to make sure they couldn't get drafted you know it was pretty bad and some people who went to canada i knew i knew people who went to canada um and it was not a very good experience you know they were usually thrown right in jail in canada and uh that was it was a tough life but you know but anyway, if you want a little example of a kind of a more mundane tragedy. Yes, why please. We, why don't we move to writer's block? I mean, isn't that a horrible thing for writers and poets? Um, so here's a poem called Writer's Block. From the from the book. It's from Miracles. From Inc. the book. Keep me going. Writer's that is block. totally purchasable. That is out already. <laughs> the links, the links yes. will be embedded in the podcast post. Really, and, and and from the bottom of my charitable heart, I could send it to almost anyone. So anyway, this is called Writer's Block. Under 20 yeah. bucks. Writer's Block. So new for me, usually I suffer from logorrhea, not its nasty little cousin. What a strange discipline writing poetry is. You create a good one, and then poof, you may never write another. You can't blame the weather for your dry spell or the pandemic for your empty quiver. Only your skimpy imagination, your failure to order life's scree, find your soul in a nearby ripple, or appreciate the composition of a neighbor's coarse ashlar. Inside, there's a stickle about word choice, pun punctuation, or whether anyone would find your work a tiny bit interesting, all of which adds to your hebitude until, desperate, you consult the back flap of your notebook where you've listed words like scree, riffle, ashlar, stickle, and hebitude. Words you can throw into a poem. Literary life jackets that rescue stranded bards, keep, keeps them afloat, prevents their drowning in self-criticism and doubt. <laughs> If it only were that easy, though, is it right? <laughs> Unfortunately, well, or fortunately for me, it is. I mean, I do have log logorrhea. I just, I, 
you know, my my idea of writer's block is if I can't come up with an idea in 15 minutes. Otherwise, mm. I'm, I'm okay. <laughs> Have you ever had That's writer's what... block? Um, I go through dry periods. I go through periods where uh, academia takes my words. The start of the school year, the new the new academic year has taken my words. It's been it's been a minute since I've written anything newish. I have some titles, I have ideas, but in terms of uh I owe I owe an old professor of mine uh oh crap, it's the fourth. In eleven days, I owe an old professor of mine an abstract for an article I'm gonna write uh for faith and literature about William James and mysticism. Oh wow! Popular music. Um, so that's going to take all of my words for the next two weeks. It's less than two weeks now. Well, William James was such a brilliant guy. I mean, that was a really interesting person. Such a he was very interested in consciousness, you know. And he and Freud met uh, when Freud came to uh, the United States. I believe it was in 1909, though. Don't quote me. Um, and here, you know, it was fascinating, the meeting between this guy who was interested in the unconscious <laughs> and this other guy who was interested in the uh, in consciousness. And neither one of them thought too much about the other, evidently. They just weren't impressed. Oh, they weren't impressed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you can understand it, you know. Um I can, I can. And and they were probably, I mean, and maybe he said, you know, why is your brother's book so you know, there's that great line about Henry and William. What? William wrote philosophical treaties like they were novels, and Henry wrote novels oh, like they were wow. philosophical treaties. Oh, I have a, had a horrible time trying to get through uh, Portrait portrait of a Lady. Portrait yeah. of a Lady, yeah. Um, I, I, I had to read that for grad school, and I, I've never thrown a book on the floor before or since <laughs> after I read the last word. Yeah. Oh, it's but awesome. I spiked that book Ooh. like a like a football afterwards. But he never, but yeah. He never so meant, I he never met an adjective he didn't love. I mean, it just uh, absolutely yeah. But speaking of grad a compound school, complex sentence structure, what a nice segue because I could I could read this poem called French. Yes, please do. I feel like we're in a, like in a musical. You know, you know when they do things like, well, do you have the keys, John? And he says, I have the keys and I have a song. I've got the keys. No. Anyway. That that you know, that is a great metaphor for how the whenever I have a poet on the podcast and how that actually works. <laughs> you know, oh, we just need the I, you know, I should have a keyboard in here and it should be a twinkling <laughs> of a piano, and then suddenly <laughs> okay. uh, and then just launch into yes. So this one is called French for Reading, which I had to pass. Uh I I was accepted into the doctoral program in psychology at Duquesne, but on the condition, as though we all were, that we passed uh, a language uh, for, you know, language exam. Uh, so th mine was French. French for reading. It was the requirement I most feared. We had to pass a language competency exam to progress into the PhD program. I chose French even though my past romance with that language had been mostly unrequited. I managed to squeeze out a B in a brutal summer course at the University of Denver so I could graduate. And then at Christmas 1976, I was beset with lingo Franco again. This time it was French for reading. I found myself 54 four chapters behind as we entered Christmas break. 54 chapters. I also had to study for an exam in Heidegger's philosophy, which didn't improve my Zine or Zit. If, as Marty proclaimed, death is our own most possibility, I hoped it would arrive soon. 54 chapters behind. How to catch up? I selected the Chatham College Library because it was close to home and I'd never seen any of those rich girls congregating around the stacks. 
I arose every morning at seven, ate a quick breakfast, packed a sandwich in a thermos of hot tea, and drove to the library where I parlez vous Francais uh, and read Bean and Time for eight hours a day, every day during that precious Christmas break. My sweet wife was justly irrité, mais que pourrait je faire? She wasn't anywhere near as irrité as the security guard at Chatham, whom I called from the empty library one evening after I'd lost myself in the ecstasy of always already being da in the world and hadn't noticed the library going dark. I tried the main door, but it was chain locked from the front, the front of the buxom security guard, the creak of her leather. Oh, I'm sorry. Wait a minute. <laughs> no, that's uh, doesn't work at all. But it was chain locked from the front. <clears throat> the frown of the bux, buxom security guard, the creak of her leather belt and the roll of her eyes conveyed that she was dealing with someone who had fallen 54 chapters behind in his French class. Freed from the tomb of tomes, I passed my French comps and my Heidegger exam and reveled for the next nine years in the atre et le niat of my PhD program. That was being in nothingness of my PhD program. <laughs> Oh dear, Heidegger and cramming for a language exam. That's that does sound like hell. Yeah, it really was. It really was. Oh my god. Oh. But I got the I I got the highest grade in the class on the French exam, and uh, I got a. I believe I got a B on the Heidegger. Which was okay, fine. I mean, you know, it wasn't my. Yeah, name. I mean, he's he was a Nazi, so whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, that was a protest. I would could have gotten an A, but I realized he was a Nazi. No, that didn't work out. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Um. Actually, we had uh. There was an experience. There was a moment at our English graduate conference uh, where one of our graduate students, um, just politely destroyed someone from another institution who was sort of like they were using heidegger it was like well yes but you know he was a nazi but we're not dealing with that and, yeah. and then in the q a just kind of politely said well actually because he works here 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 and does all of this it all sort of lines up so it is sort of important and just you know i, I wonder if that person ever recovered or got over it i don't know but it was it was quite impressive and i was like oh that person's getting a tenure truck job one day yeah boy i'll tell you there was a lot of denial i mean i remember bringing this up when i was on the faculty of the psychology department you know it was an existential phenomenological um department and i brought this up to the chair i said you know i think we really got to uh, have a panel or something or, you know a conference or something to confront this awful news about Heidegger and he said to me our our job is to honor Heidegger not to question him yikes yeah yeah it was incredible denial because as as um who was the Nietzsche's translator that I like so much I forget the guy's name he was a very he died very young um Oh, I can't remember his name now. But anyway, he he brought up how that if you study Heidegger long enough, you have to you just got to say that he was great. Otherwise, how do you justify going through that horrible word salad? And, and uh, you know, I mean, being in time is like just unbelievably difficult to read, you know, it's just. You know, yeah, Dasein is that being whose very being it is to question its being. You know, you have sentence sentences like that over and over again. Very difficult, but yeah, no, I mean it was too bad. I mean, he, uh, if you believe the philosophers, he really overturned two thousand years of philosophy. But he wasn't smart enough to 
see see um you know that he was engaged in a fascist project and uh it was horrible yeah 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 mm -hmm. And I, I mean, the new rev there was that new revelation within the last like, 10 years of more of his personal letters that he would wrote, write to people about their Fuhrer. And well, the the that's right. He he wrote. Um, uh, it was either Jaspers or Hannah Arendt. Mm -hmm. He wrote, they said, how you know, one of them said, how could you possibly um, follow this guy? And he said he wrote back, just look at his hands. It was, you know, I mean, you know, pretty screwed up. <laughs> Just really, and then also, I guess the the the, I think they're calling it the Black Diaries, have come yes, out. Yes, the Black Diaries. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah, the Black yeah. Diaries coming out, and yeah, that's pretty. Cool. Where in some cases, writing, you know, somebody compared. I think was it for the New Yorker, the review talked about how you know he writes like a twelve year old boy. When talking, well, about I don't know. I can't agree with that, but I mean, he, he you know, um, in some of the in some of the stuff, but yeah. Oh, in 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 the diaries, are you talking about? In the diaries, oh, yeah. Oh, okay. No, I was. Yeah, <laughs> that he he <laughs> write like just so uncritical about trying to upend two thousand years of philosophy, but then. Yeah, oh, that's boy, it. which is again an interesting parallel to the first poem and these weird times that we live in. Seemingly sensible people lose are, are are in mass losing their minds. Well, I don't know whether I I, I can get a segue out of this. Uh, but yeah, say I was reading another poem. This is a relentless downer. We, we, I, I started this podcast <laughs> by talking about humor, and now we're just like it's all fascism, fascism. Right? Yeah. Everybody, you know, everybody's going to get sucked in, even your mom. For some, you know, which yeah, no. So what do you got? Well, I'll try to, uh, what about, since we're talking about horrible failings, what about a poem yes. called Failing Up? <laughs> okay. This actually has to do, unfortunately, with my, with my brother-in-law was a real doofus, <laughs> but I don't say that in, in the poem, but that's really the truth about this. It's called Failing Up. My friend Gus carried the book failing up around like it was the Bible, which in a way it was for him. Gus failed up like our cats threw up. They couldn't learn not to lick wads of fur off their soft bodies, so they puked, often and arrogantly. Gus squeaked by with an odd job here, an even odder job there. Still, he attracted a lovely woman who spent hours toning her body at the gym, the gym where Gus would do a few push-ups, some casual sit-ups, maybe a knee bend before retiring to the snack bar for a veggie burger and power shake. No one was allowed to attend the wedding ceremony. Gus said it was too sacred to pollute with witnesses, although their often pincher, acne, stood up for them often uh, or when offered a biscuit and a justice of the so-called peace presided. I think a northern pine was present. At their wedding reception, people bet on how long their marriage would last. Immediately after the ceremony, Gus's wife began to hound him with unreasonable demands. Get a job, you blowhard, she bellowed. Pay the bills, pick up your underwear, that sort of thing. It lasted one day longer than the prenup. It lasted one day longer than the prenup. Ten terror-filled years of drugs and booze and abuse on both sides. There was, of course, a child who asked for none of this, but got it all. Oof. Feel better? <laughs> no. <laughs> There was a child that asked for none of this, but got, got it, it all. all. But got it all. Mm. That's what happens, unfortunately. Yeah. These kids get everything. Ugh. So how many books is this for you now? This is this is number seven. 
this is the number seven, seven and you're already shopping around number eight. Yep, number eight is out. Is is getting uh, looked at. So getting looked at. Yeah, which I you know one of the things I really sort of admire about you, and I will say envy a bit, in that you know in retirement now the writing is the full time gig, right? Yes. Yeah. And I guess what what does it mean to be in your position, and to have both this perspective of years and all of this time to write? It's really like two of these poems. Like one poem is very embedded that you read so far is very right now, and two are set in memory. And I find myself remarkably sort of still thinking about childhood and thinking about twenty years ago. And makes me wonder, you know, if I live long enough, what am I going to write about in the, in the next 30 years? It's very interesting. That's such a great question. I mean, uh, um, you know, my wife, Judy, is also a poet. We're both we're both uh, retired. We were both shrinks. She was a psychiatrist and I was a psychologist. She hates she hates it when I say this. When people ask, well, what was the difference? I I always say she drugged him and I helped him get over it. You know, uh, <laughs> she doesn't care for that. But um, it, it's just fantastic. I mean, um, I had two analyses, you know, and I've learned much more about myself and my world and the other others in my world from writing poems than I ever did in those ex horribly expensive, painful, and long analyses. Um, so it's it was great. It was great to have a career. We both really loved our careers. I was an analyst for thirty five years. Uh, loved it. Lo I thought I it was a real privilege to be invited in other people's minds and lives and works. Um, but it was good to leave that and then to have this happen has just been absolutely wonderful and so it, it is fascinating to answer your question how how uh, much memory does come back and you know you you think about all these things that happen in a completely different way because it's not clinical anymore it's just what happened and how did it form me and and how did it um how does it affect people around me? And can I find something that um, relates to everybody from my experience? Because one of the main reasons I write is because I want to come in contact with other people. I love, for instance, I love being on mm. Facebook. I've come into contact with a whole slew, a community of poets all over the uh, world, actually. And I love that, you know. Um, but anyway, to get back to your main question yeah it, it's when all you yeah i don't have to do anything except read i read like crazy i read every morning i read i start my day by reading and then in the afternoons i write and um it's great it's just a wonderful thing so i hope you get to do that man i know that um you know i was a professor for 15 years and it was uh really very difficult to do much i did publish a lot of papers but um you know you had to struggle to do it usually and you know you have all the teaching requirements and while i really enjoyed the teaching and coming into contact with the students i did not enjoy the colleagues at all i mean a lot of them were pretty screwed up and and um, i was happy to get out of academia because of that but um, I miss I miss teaching. I really enjoyed that part. But it's hard, you know. You have to. You're talking about how in the next two weeks you're going to be writing and uh, something, you know, technical, which I want to read because um, I really like your writing. But um, yeah, it, your job can interfere with your creativity. It's just it it just worked out for Judy and I. For, I mean, we had the job, mm -hmm. we made the money. And now, because uh, as I tell people, um, you have to have a very unique mental illness to think that you could make any money writing poetry. <laughs> so that's not the reason you write poems, right? Yeah. But, um, yeah. Well, I mean, do you find, you know, 
do you surprise yourself with the things that come back? And do you surprise yourself with the insights that come? I guess you did say that a little bit, that you do sort of, you find yourself thinking about things radically different. Both, both. It's surprising both. about what does come back, things that, you know, I've totally forgotten about. I, I can't think of anything right off hand, but but both. I mean, writing, one of the things I love about writing poems is I use, I, you know, I don't know if this happens to you, but for me, I can I have an idea what I want to write about. I start to write, and then it turns out I write about something completely different. Mm -hmm. And then the endings often are complete surprises to me. And that's really good because if the writer is surprised, the reader will be too. And um, yeah. so I mean, it's one of the things I love about poems and poetry is that, man, you know, uh, you start out writing and then, wow, who knows where it's going to go. And it's fun. You know, that's fun seeing where that stuff goes. Yeah, it always, it, it's made me so aware of the leap that you have to make from idea and intention to end result and how the a poems, a poem really can, I mean, it's, I'm not a real mystical kind of guy, but there's almost something mystical about the when a piece of writing takes on its own life it's and, and takes and becomes its own thing. It's true. And that you suddenly then, you know, the cart has momentum and you can meet, you no longer have to push, you can only steer and try not to hit the wall. That is so true. So think, and, it, you know, you know me, I mean, I'm an atheist. I, you know, I don't get into any of that stuff. But it is almost like something else is happening. And some of these yeah. lines, you think, wow. I mean, I've even written that, that, you know, I got a line from the God I don't believe in. You know, it's like, wow. You know, it is an amazing process, isn't it? Where it's almost like you're taking dictation sometimes, you know. Yeah. And and then thinking about like, you know, and, and developing that sort of critical eye to know, well, this is what it has to be to be a poem. And this is what it has to be to have that singularity and sense of form. Which is, yeah, it is sort of, you know, a miracle that can keep a person going. <laughs> yeah, yeah. See how I did that segue there? Yeah, I, was, I liked that. I saw what you did. I saw what you did. <laughs> I, and again, so to, the book is out, Miracle, but the Miracles That Keep Me Going by Charlie Bryce. Uh, is out now. Uh, you can buy it uh, at Riverstone Books on September 14th, the year 2023 at 7 p.m. I will be reading along with Miss Macross, Jay Carson, um, and Charlie, of course. Uh, you can also, I will have Charlie's email address on the website, gonna die podcast.com as a way of finding it i guess there's i mean is there is there a link from the publisher too is there just just you though you you you're the well, best it's pretty much it. me the publishers are great they're wonderful it's it's word tech editions and these guys are fantastic but pretty much you know with the you. smaller presses you pretty much have to promote your own work but they mm -hmm. uh they've always done uh, uh kevin waltzer and Lori jerry have always been fantastic people to work with so I'm very, very and so happy. I will steer people your way. Yeah, it's it is now time for the bottom of five, a series of questions not related to our main topic that of uh, that are of a surrealistic and or philosophical nature. Charlie, are you ready? I'm ready, man. All right, and you know what? Actually, I I was thinking about this, and I was like, is this too on the nose? Be, being a psychologist, but question one. What is the personal limitation or limit to experience that most people impose upon themselves? It's uh, it's the critical, it it's the critic, the inner critic, the part that says, "Oh, don't write about that," or "Oh, that's no good." That if you want to be a writer, if you want to write poems or novels or anything, you have to get get a hold of that and tell it that mm. scoop. Just, but you have to pay attention to it because if you don't pay attention to it, all it does is inhibit you. So the minute 
I, I, I once ran a seminar, uh, a workshop on writing humorous poetry. And the first rule was to listen to the uh, your your mind. And every time it, uh, you hear something like, oh, you can't write about that. That's what you write about. Because mm. that's what's going to turn out to be funny. <laughs> But it's also this interesting thing. It's, it, you know, you, you bring that up. It is something I, I work with with students. This idea, like, the more personal you get, weirdly, the more relatable. Oh, yeah. Things can be. And that you find the big themes in the small moments. Although... although and that's how, you, that's how you honor big feelings in poetry. You, you, I, think, I think what really conveys feeling to a reader is imagery. I think if you mm. if you get really clear images, and it doesn't have to be confessional poetry, you know, it can be poetry. Like if you read, you know, again, one of my favorite poets, Billy Collins, or, um, um, well, Billy Billy's a a good example. Uh, he doesn't write, you know, about himself hardly at all. He writes about the world, and and um, uh, David Kirby, who's really mm. uh, who I actually I dedicated my next book to he is just one of my poetic heroes and he mm. writes about all kinds of academic stuff in really funny mm. ways everything from little Richard to um, Shakespeare I mean it's an amazing thing if you get a chance to read him he's he's really worth it anyway all right prompt. this is not a question but more of a prompt Tell me a happy but somewhat unremarkable remember. Tell me a happy but somewhat unremarkable memory of your childhood. Oh, well, okay, that's interesting. Gee, now you're getting me to have a memory I hadn't for a long time. So, I um, was sitting in a class. I think I was in fourth grade, and some uh the band the band director and a few musicians came into the room and they were um trying to recruit people to be in the in the band and i saw the instruments and stuff but i you know i had i had and have dyslexia and the only the only instrument i was sure that i could spell was drum <laughs> so i put down that i wanted to play drums and and actually, um, I did. Tony Crabelli, the band director, taught me how to do you know double stroke rolls, single stroke rolls, five stroke rolls, all this stuff. Read and read music, and you know I wound up um, playing in some one wonderful. I, I played in a garage band called the Rogues, and I played in a soul band called the Kansas City Soul Association. I mean, it was just wonderful. And I have in this room over here, behind me, the exact drum set of Ringo Starr. It's a Ludwig Oyster Pearl with Zelgen cymbals. It's the exact same set, which I bought when I was 16 in Cheyenne, Wyoming for $880 brand new that I paid for five months before it came in because I was making so much money in this band I was in, the Rogues. So there's a oh. little memory. <laughs> wow, the eight, I'm I'm in my brain. I'm trying to calculate adjust that for inflation. Oh, now I think I looked it up. Those things are going for thirty thousand, twenty twenty thirty thousand dollars. So here's the question of the Ringo question: Are you are you a left? Are you left handed? No, I'm not. I just found out that Ringo was left handed, and that's when yes, that's and. And the thing that I heard from a friend actually is part of why what made Ringo a great drummer, which is why when they did the rock band video game, doing Ringo's parts were very difficult, is that that's a right-handed kit you have. Left-handed kits did not exist yet. And so when Ringo, Ringo could come out of a fill on his strong hand in ways that other drummers... So he was a, he's a lefty, but played a right-handed kit. Which is what made him such a unique drummer. It, it's why you hear the the um, the beats you hear on like Strawberry Fields Forever, you know, da 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 da, because he's 
he's he's going like this, but his lead hand is comes down first. Da 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 da. da. Whereas if you're a right handy, your your lead hand comes down first on your on the right. So it made for a completely different sound, especially when they got into the more psychedelic <laughs> stuff. Yeah. yeah, it's great, isn't it? I mean, I didn't know that. Yeah. I'm glad I didn't know that because I would have tried to be left-handed. That's how much I loved Ringo Starr. Mm. <laughs> mm. Well, and it, the, the way I learned it was the context of someone telling me about like trying to drum, trying to do the drums for Dear Prudence. Oh, wow. And just not being able to, or was in was in a band and the, they were thinking about covering Dear Prudence and uh, having a drummer who was very mathematical and very scientific in the way that they thought. And just could not. Well, there's this just great could not. drummer, this guy I know that's in a, a Beatles tribute band. His name is uh, Lou DeSillis. His his wife is Denise DeSillis, who's who is a tremendous poet. But Lou is an unbelievably fine drummer, and and he's got those Ringo um, moves down perfectly. And he, I believe, he's right-handed. I think he's right-handed. Wow, interesting. All right, question three. Name a film world you would like to visit or perhaps live in permanently. A I call this the Gumby oh. question. Oh. Yeah, oh. if you could Gumby your way into a DVD instead of a book. The Big Lebowski. I'd want to live there the whole time. <laughs> no doubt. That's great. You know what? I realized I said Denise DeSillis. Her name is Diane DeSillis. Mm. Anyway. Yeah, no, the big Lebowski. I'd want to be with the dude. I want to be with Walter. I'd want to figure all that out. I'd even want to, you know, get bathed in Donnie's ashes. You know, anything be okay with me. I'd like to Wonderful. hear Sam Elliott tell me not to swear so much. I, I, I would love the whole thing. <laughs> that would be that would be delightful. <laughs> all right, moving right along. Question four. Now, you said you're an atheist, but if there is a hell and you end up there, name one celebrity you expect or perhaps hope to meet. Oh, wow. This is the Mark Twain question. Wow. Jeez. Who would I like to, to see? Well, Jim Harrison, who was probably my one of my... He was, he was, when he was alive, my favorite living poet. I mean, he... I, I love Jim and his work, and he, he lived the kind of life that um, would brighten up hell a lot. <laughs> I'd love to be with him. I'd drink with him. We'd have these gourmet meals. These, you know, I don't know if you know about how he had a 37 course lunch in French, in France, and r wrote about it in the New Yorker. And after they finished this lunch, they got the bill that was like four or five of them, I think. And he said the bill came to about the amount of a new, brand new Subaru. And he said, but, you know, we didn't want a Subaru. We wanted lunch. <laughs> That's how Jim thought, you know. Wow. And I got to wow. know him a little bit. He was just a wonderful guy. It was a, yeah, great guy. Mm -hmm. All right, we're almost through this. Question five, which actually weirdly transitioned. I already picked this one out. Question five, last question of the bottom five. Name a food you wish you liked, but don't. Oh, wow. God, unfortunately, I like so much. <laughs> it's, unfortunately, I can, I can eat almost Same. anything. I can't even think of something that I, that I, well, I guess, scallops i really don't care for scallops but they look good when people eat them so maybe scallops i don't know scallops, but i think yeah. i can eat just about anything else the only thing i really can't eat is uh i can't eat um, shrimp not because i don't like it i'm i'm allergic to it unfortunately mm, so that's a good answer too <laughs> it's good to know well, all right. Again, so Charlie Bryce, um, the miracles that keep me going, 
out on Word Tech Editions, find Charlie through my website, or you know, you can probably use the Google or the Facebook. And we'll move those poetry units. I think that's about it. Our next episode will eventually happen, and it will be about something. Actually, I, I have the next one's in the works. It's going to be something radically different, sort of. We're going into the sciences and the arts. Our homepage, where you can find new and old episodes, is gonna die podcast.com. We're also we're on the big three: Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. At some point, we'll be on YouTube Music Player as well. Follow us on. Uh, follow us on Facebook, and there's that other X platform or what? Actually, no, I don't do the X anymore. So just we're all gonna die is on Facebook, but really, just subscribe to us on one of the big three, and you'll get a little pingy alert whenever a new episode happens. So what special is, thanks? Say again what the podcast is, and and slowly say what the website is. Okay, it is gonna die podcast dot com. Go to dot gonna die. G O N N A D I E podcast.com. Uh, we're all going to die. And other fun facts can be found on again, Apple podcasts, Spotify and Google podcasts and all of the services that piggyback off the big three. All right. Um, yeah. We're all going to die is on Facebook. I think that's the only social media account. I really still bother to do anything with. Special thanks to Andrew Fox for our new lovely, newish, lovely theme music. And thank you again so much, Charlie Bryce, for doing this. Thank you, Matt. I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Yes. All right. Later, meets.